आप सुनाइए जी ठीक है सर सो so, अभी कोल्ड है कश्मीर में हाँ ठंड है बारिश हो रही है अच्छा लेकिन लोग आते हैं यहाँ कोविड भी है लेकिन टूरिस्ट भी आते हैं जी इस वक्त बारिश हो रही है बट ऑन माउंटेन्स आई फील कि वो इट विल बी स्नोइंग यस सर दो तीन जने रह गए ना सर दीपाक्षी मैम राहुल सर और मेघ मैम आई थिंक सर वी आर लाइव ऑन द यूट्यूब नाउ ओके ओके स्वर्मगम सर इज आल्सो हियर दैट्स ग्रेट गुड आफ्टरनून सर मे बी प्रोफेसर आरुमुगम इज जस्ट एडजस्टिंग गुड आफ्टरनून प्रोफेसर आरुमुगम फाइन हाउ आर यू फाइन फाइन कोविड ऑल so taking care and okay so shall we start sir so mr shall we start yes sir okay. so good afternoon everyone greeting from ramanujan college i dr rajesh singh an assistant professor in department of mathematics ramanujan college on behalf of the organizing committee of this refresher course welcomes you all hoping that the past week of the refresher course was fruitful and motivating for you all today we have two live sessions with speakers who are stalwarts in the field of graph theory we bring together the best of north and south of india with one speaker from kashmir and the other from tamil nadu our first speaker of the day a great human being and an inspiration to young minds is dr s p zada dr p zada is a professor at department of mathematics university of kashmir he was head of the department of mathematics university of kashmir during 2014 to 2017 he has also held the prestigious position of being dean of school of physical and mathematical sciences from 2017 to 2020 he has done his masters in mathematics from university of kashmir in 1990 and then completed his phd in applied mathematics from aligarh muslim university in 1995 he has several research papers to his credit in journals of international repute He has guided ten PhD students. He is recipient of many awards and fellowships from reputed organizations at national and international level. He has completed three research projects funded by CERB DST and one research project funded by UGC. He has seven international research collaborators and is in the editorial board of some highly ranked international journals. We thank Professor P Zada for accepting our invitation. to deliver an invited lecture in this refresher course now i would like to invite professor peer zada to deliver his talk on an application to graph theory and its an introduction to graph theory and its application please sir thank you rajesh and thank you all the members of the committee who are organizing this uh, very good event uh, which would have been otherwise very nice it was offline 
it's always refreshing when our young teachers uh, we discuss we interact each other and i'll be highly thankful for this opportunity so regarding my talk so let me first uh, share my screen and then i will start my lecture okay so i hope it's clear yes sir it is very well okay so this is a general talk where of course at the end of the day mathematics will be involved so i am really thrilled by these three examples which happened uh, in the due course maybe it started some 150 200 years before and the importance of these three examples is so marvelous that this gave rise to a big theory which is presently called as graph theory as you know that uh, doing mathematics it started some uh, olden times like uh, people believe that mathematics in fact started from 30000 years before christ so it has its marvelous history and then with the passage of time new things came into light and people were doing and many many things many many changes happened over the this period of time now why these three problems you will see when we discuss these three problems they are so simple so easy to understand that is if anyone without having any knowledge of science or mathematics will definitely understand the crux of these three examples and as i said that they are so great examples that ultimately graph theory and commutatorics came out of these three simple examples as you will see in the later next lecture more on applications will be talked so now imagine these days doing mathematics or doing sciences without graph theory it looks like uh, our our doing of things is incomplete because this graph theory has now crept in the main curriculum of mathematics and sciences so let me start the first problem which is called as the konigsberg bridge problem so it started in 1254 the teutonic knights who were placed in jerusalem that time it was like a force it was made a force by the king whose name was bohemian king ottokar ii so the, these knights were like uh, the army the strong army at that time so they were used in the crusades like the first crusade and the second crusade against the prussians there was a city in prussia now it's called as kalingrad in russia which was set on both side of the river the river was a regal river so there was a river flowing and this uh, town or city of konigsberg was divided in fact into four parts with these two sides of the river the two islands were formed so in total there were four areas so two islands and the two side banks of the river and they were connected by seven bridges at that time in fact those seven bridges at that time did exist so this looks the this is the picture the art picture how that uh, city use look at that point of time so you can see in this presentation there are bridges there is the river flowing of course the width is not that large but the bridges are here we can see and we can count them in fact there are seven bridges and four land areas where we can see the 
churches, the residential areas, and other things. So this city was a trading center and it was strategically located at that time. And the economy was also very good for this city because the trade, being the trade center, the people used to go here and there. And that's what they, they were supposed like the good economy or the healthy economy, they used to make the bridges for their convenience. So seven bridges were there. And one of the islands was called as Nifop. So as the river flowed around Nifop, literally meaning pub yard, there was another island, which I mentioned earlier. So there were two islands and two banks. This is one of the pictures of recent times of this Konigsberg. This is one side of it. You can see an old cathedral here of olden times and the water flowing here. One bridge is visible and other bridges also visible here. And these bridges were called as Blacksmith Bridge, the Connecting Bridge, Green Bridge, Wooden Bridge, High Bridge and Honey Bridge. So they were named after these. Uh, these were the seven names for these bridges. So uh, you can see <laughs> this looks strange doing mathematics and giving some historical facts. We don't see any connection now between these historical facts and the mathematics. But really there is a great connection which we will be discussing. Now, if we make a picture of this, like if we want to sketch a diagram, I cannot say a graph now, I just will say a sketch of this Konigsberg. So here it looks as the four land areas, this is A, B, C, and D, their land areas, and the rectangular pictures, there are seven bridges. So what is the problem now? How we start this Konigsberg bridge problem? Let's start from any one of the four land areas. We have to walk over all the seven bridges exactly once, and we have to return to the starting point. This came to mind at that time. It's like earlier 18th century, that's 1730 or 17 something. And somebody, like in his mind came, okay, if we try walking over these four land areas, we should cover this bridge exactly once and reach the starting point. As I mentioned, this place was a nice place, really people used to visit there being the trade center and the morning, of course, in the whole day, people used to walk through these bridges or to have like morning walk or evening walk and so on. This is the time where this idea struck to the mind of someone there and the question was raised, can we start from any one of the land areas out of these four, travel all the four bridges exactly once and reach the starting point? Here it is. So we have seven bridges here it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and people try to start walking. They have to cover all the seven bridges exactly once and reach the starting point. So this Konigsberg, or we can say here, Nixberg was not too far from St. Petersburg. I'm sorry, this is Konigsberg here. This was not too far from St. Petersburg, which was the home of famous mathematician Eiler. So since most of us do some mathematics, we are aware of the contributions of Euler. In fact, he has contributed in all parts of mathematics. So he was living in St. Petersburg. He was a German mathematician. And this Konigsberg was situated close to his native town. So the question is, there's a connection between this problem and Euler. And the question is, first of all, this looks like a puzzle. This looks like something somebody has said and it is a day-to-day -day happening. 
it does not give us anything whether we can do it whether this walk is possible or not so the question was raised about Euler why he should be concerned about this problem which was total unrelated with mathematics as you have seen we didn't use any mathematics till now and the second point in the mind was why would such a great mathematician spend a great deal of time with a trivial problem like the Konigsberg problem it looks it's a trivial problem. It seems it's a trivial problem because everyone can understand it within half a minute. So this was the second question. And the third question was, Euler was a very busy person. He was doing mathematics all time. He published 500 books and papers together during his lifetime. And it is being said that in 75 alone, he wrote an average of one mathematical paper per week. And those research papers are really marvelous. They set the fundamental tone in mathematics and other sciences. And the topics he used to work was mechanics, optics, astronomy, navigation, and hydrodynamics. Again, one can ask why these topics, why didn't he do in other areas, of course, he did in other areas, but these were the famous areas that time. We didn't have abstract algebra. We were not having topology, functional analysis, or the latest of this mathematics, which we do now. They were not appearing at that point of time. So mechanics was there, optics was there, astronomy was there, navigation and hydrodynamics was there. And we had, of course, Euclidean geometry, and something non euclidean geometry had also come into existence. So these three questions are being asked about Euler. Why should he be interested in such a problem? And you can see the response from Euler was that this problem seemed to be trivial, as he wrote in a letter to Carl Leonhard Heller. He was the major mayor of Danzig that time. And uh, we can note one, one very important point. Before 200 years or 100 years, the mayors, the, 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 the people who uh, used to administer the day-to-day the -day happenings, they were uh, some way or the other in touch with the scientists and the mathematicians. So the letter was here. So this great mathematician, Euler, responded in the letter. It was written to the mayor. Thus you see, most noble sir, how this type of solution bears little relation to mathematics. And I do not understand why you expect a mathematician to produce it rather than anyone else. For the solution is based on reason alone. And its discovery does not depend on any mathematical principle. Because of this, I do not know why even questions which bear so little relationship to mathematics are solved more quickly by mathematicians than by others. OK, what happened next? Euler found this problem trivial. He was still intrigued by it. Once again, he wrote a letter to Marinoni. He was an Italian mathematician and engineer. And here is the quote of that letter. This question lacks originality. The question of traveling about the seven bridges exactly once. It doesn't ha have anything in origin, but it seemed to me worthy of attention. This is important here. Worthy of attention since neither geometry, nor algebra, nor even the art of counting was sufficient to solve it. So here is the central point. Means Euler had given a try to this problem. He had used whatever mathematics was present at that time, like geometry was there, algebra was there, the initial algebra. And then the number theory was there, where we use this counting and other principles, which means that application of all these fields did not make a solution. The problem was trivial. The problem did not have originality. But it had some sense because it was not that easy to find a solution. So I believe this problem was related to a topic that 
got fried, Lebanese had once discussed and longed to work with something Lebanese referred to as geometry sites or geometry of position. So Lebanese was also aware of these developments. This so-called geometry of position is what is now called graph theory, which I introduces and utilizes while solving this problem. So Lebanese knew this, this theory as, it was not well-structured theory. There was just a concept lying here and there. So Lebanese used to call it as geometry of position. And nowadays we call it as graph theory after giving a proper structure to this course, to this area of research. And what happened? Finally, in 1735, I approved that the problem has no solution. Means it cannot be done. We start from one land area, travel all the four bridges exactly once, cannot be done. And the people used to try for it. They used to try from one land area, cover all, try to cover all the bridges, but they never used to reach the starting point. If they start from A, they used to end up at situation C or situation B and so on. So the question in their mind at that point of time was that, can it be done or not? Since they were not able to do it, they used to try it again and again. And ultimately it was the famous mathematician Euler who proved in 19, uh, sorry, in 1735 that the problem has no solution. So how did he prove it? The difficulty was the development of a technique of analysis and subsequent tests that established this assertion with mathematical rigor. So before coming to the final law that it cannot be done, they used to try several things in order to find the solution. So I will give three guidelines that someone can use for this problem. One was the claim was that there are more than two landmasses with an odd number of bridges. If this happens, then no such journey is possible. Second was, if the number of bridges is odd for exactly two landmasses, then the journey is possible if one starts in one of the two odd number landmasses. So this was being like with conditions, it can happen or it cannot happen. And the third one was, there are no regions with an odd number of land masses, then only the journey can be done starting in any region. So ultimately, I modeled the bridge problem by a graph taking each land mass as a vertex and each bridge as an edge. So here we are now. What did he do about geometry of position? So he thought about that, let's take the set so once we take a set, the set contains the land areas. So we have land areas, the number of land areas is four. So the set will contain four elements in this problem. And he called these four elements as, or the four members of this set as the vertices. So let's see how genius, uh, geniusness is working. Once we call them as vertices, they are not geometrical points. They can be small, they can be big. And now we try to plot it on a plain paper. So we have a plain paper, we just make small dots and we name these four dots as land area A, land area B, C and D. Now let's see where the bridge existed. The bridge was between A and B or B and C or A and D or anything else, how we represent these bridges by a picture. So what Euler did, our these small dots or small circles or the members of this set, which he called as vertices, if there exists a bridge between two members, he used to draw a line. Again, this is not a geometrical line. This is just a line which can be straight, which can be curved. It's anybody's convenience whatever looks nice and good. So you can draw that line. Then 
What was the logic? I'll reason that anyone standing on land would have to have a way to get on and off. Thus, each landmass would need an even number of bridges. This is the central idea of this Konigsberg bridge problem. So once we do it in this form, we can look on this picture. We have these four members of the set, which are vertices, and we have the bridges. Here two bridges exist, here two bridges exist, here there's one bridge and so on. So the idea in Euler's mind was that once you have to walk this bridge, you have to enter a land area. Once you enter the land area, you have to immediately leave the land area because you have to reach a starting point. So this was the main breakthrough. Once we enter a land area, we have to leave. We can enter the land area n number of times, depending how many bridges are available. So we can go to land area A or B oftenly. But once we go there, we have to come back. Coming back means you should have another bridge. So going in and coming out is two to the contribution. And if you go K times, it will be twice K. So Euler summarized this. He, he, he noted that entering a land area and coming out has something to do with the even contribution, even number. That's why we should have even number of bridges touching a certain land area. If we have this, the solution of this problem is possible. Means one can start from a land area, cover all the seven bridges or whatever number of bridges exactly once he can reach the starting point. Now what happened to the Konigsberg bridge problem? We can see here, here it is only three, it is not even. So there are three bridges, it's not even number of bridges. Here we have five bridges, it's not even number of bridges. So this fails at every land area. So if the number of bridges touching the land area is even, this walk is possible. And nowadays when this subject developed, when we have the vertex set, these lines were called as edges. And then how many bridges, how many lines touch the vertex? It's called as degree of the vertex. So we can be giving simultaneously a few, few things from the graph theoretical point of view so that we can understand fully the problem. So here, if we want to see what's the degree of this vertex, it's three. What's the degree of this vertex is five. It's three, it's three. So Euler was laying the theory. He said, choose the set of points, which are called as vertices, of course, a finite set. If any two have a relation, here the relation is bridge, but in general case, it can be any relation. We have a line, which is called an edge. And the number of lines touching the vertex is the degree of the vertex, which we call now by the incidence relation or the adjacency relation. So if there is a line between two vertices, we say two vertices are adjacent, they are related. If there's no line, no edge, they are unrelated. And if there is an edge, it has two endpoints, we say the edge is incident on this vertex, the starting vertex and the end vertex. So more formally, Euler formed a law, which is called as Euler's theorem one of the starting good results in graph theory. A connected graph G is an Euler graph if and only if all vertices of G are of even degree. Now here, there's a term Euler graph. What do we mean by this Euler graph? Euler graph means if such walk is possible, we start with a vertex without repeating the bridges. Now I'm talking graph theoretically. We start from a vertex, travel through the edges exactly once and reach the starting vertex. So this walk, this traveling is called as Euler line. If the graph has Euler line, it's said to be Euler graph. So then the question was, is every graph an Euler graph? No, every graph is not an Euler graph. 
This was done by the help of this theorem. I'll prove that a graph is an Euler graph if and only if all the vertices of, are of even degree. So let's now come to the graph uh, theoretical model of this Konigsberg bridge problem, which was here. You can see there are several vertices of our degree. In fact, all vertices of our degree. So this is not an Euler graph. Or we can say this graph is not Eulerian. Once it is not Eulerian, it does not have a closed walk, which starts from the vertex, covers through all the bridges, and reaches the starting point. That's how Euler disproved this saying that there is a walk. And now this is a real time, even I cannot say it's a real time problem. A real time problem in the sense that usually we deal with the problems in real time where there is the requirement of finding a solution. We are forced to find the solution because it is the necessity. For example, the unfortunate COVID, all scientists have been working on it. We have to get a vaccine. Vaccine is there. This is a necessity. But this walking was not a necessity. It was just, a, a, OK, I want to travel from one place to another place. Is it possible or not? How does it matter for me or anyone else whether it is possible or not? But you can see it has totally given a shape to new area of mathematics. And a terrible thing happened. This, this theory has risen so high that in the present day, like I said earlier, we cannot expect mathematical, great mathematical problems to be solved without having smaller or deeper knowledge of this combinatorics and graph theory. A few things more about this Konigsberg bridge because, before I come to another problem. Now, after this solution, graph theory really developed. It boomed. But what happened to the town of Konigsberg Bridge? It had a different fate. In the 19th century, the sad and war-torn fate that awaited it as host for one of the fierce battles of World War II. During four days in August 1944, British bombers destroyed both the old town and the northern parts of Konigsberg. So from January to February 1945, the Konigsberg was surrounded by Russian forces. German civilians begin to evacuate from that place. Many killings were there, unfortunately. But in 1945, we see the Red Army captures Konigsberg with about 90% of the old town lying in ruins. So 90% town was destroyed. Many of the bridges also get, got destroyed during these bombings and the town can no longer ask the same intriguing question. Now, this question cannot be asked because we don't have now seven bridges. Konigsberg lost its glory by this happening. But even the name was changed. Konigsberg became Kalingrad. Regal River became Regolia. But what happened, graph theory is still there. The invention, the making of graph theory, the birth of graph theory, which took place, it's still developing. It is still going to the great heights, although there are no seven bridges there at this point of time. The town also looks different, but the formation of a completely new branch of mathematics graph theory is still there. This is one problem which I really love to discuss all time. And I come to the second problem, which again is so simple that if you discuss just having a cup of tea in the canteen or traveling in a bus with your friend, you can discuss and you will see that. For me, if you discuss this problem with the conductor of the bus, when you reach the station, he will also say that I have understood this problem. But the end, the uh, seriousness in the problem, the solution is something which only great minds can understand. This problem is so simple 
that if we look at the world map or we look at the atlas of this time, usually the countries are colored in a different color. It has a common sense. The common sense is that no two neighboring countries should get the same color because then only the region of a specific country is visible. We can see here and here, different colors, here and here, different colors. And this is in the Atlas also, we find it everywhere. And then the question is, okay, the present day map of the world has 200 some countries. And if we have 200 some colors to color this map, it is so simple. Even a grade two student can color it. But let's shrink this possibility. Imagine that we have 200 countries map and we are, we are given with 199 colors. The question is, can we do it? Of course we can do it. For 199 countries, we give these 199 colors. So every country gets a different color. And then the question is the 200th country, because I don't have any color now available. I have to choose one among these used colors. And there I really have to think over it, which color I use for this country from these used colors so that it should not get the same color with its adjacent country. Here is another example. You can see they have been colored by four colors. Now, why I, I choose these examples for four colors? Because the example, the problem suggests that I am doing something with four color theorem. Means I have to concentrate on the use of four colors. We'll come to know. Here again, you can see four colors are used. And in this picture also, four colors are used. And here also the simplest way of showing how to color the regions in four colors. So the problem was now, summing up, the problem is that given a well-defined map, or we can say mathematically that we have a surface or plane and it has been divided into certain regions, and we want to color these regions. The question is, how many colors are required? For example, if I have 10 colors, just now I was explaining with 200 colors. Now I take a simpler example. Suppose we have 10 colors and 10 regions. It's very easy to be done. Now let's decrease the number of colors. Let's take nine colors. It means it's not that trivial. We have to think a little bit. Now. Decrease the number of colors to eight, seven, six. The level of difficulty goes on increasing. And it was seen that we can color any type of such map or any type of such drawing by just four colors, a marvelous piece of mathematics. We, even if we can, we can increase the number of regions, say 100, 200, 500, 1000, doesn't matter. The only thing is that it should be a well-defined case mathematically. And the question is, are four colors enough? So it was noted that Mobius was this uh, familiar with this problem in 1840, that it is sufficient to color by four colors. Actually, the problem was introduced in 1852 by Francis Guattari, who was a student of D. Morgan at that time. And the problem first appeared in a letter from D. Morgan to Hamilton. So this Francis Guattari, he knew this problem because of his brother. His brother was doing something with geography. And he was trying to color the map at that point of time. Once he was coloring the map, it's by default or by luck, he colored that map by four colors. Say that map was having 100 regions. He was successful in coloring it by four colors. His brother who was doing mathematics instantly asked him a question. Okay, you have colored this by four colors. If I increase the number of regions, say 100 becomes 1000, can we still color it by four colors? 
this was really the question in their mind. And this question was communicated to De Morgan, who then wrote a letter to Hamilton. So De Morgan continued the discussion of the problem with other mathematicians and in the years that followed, attempts were made to prove or disprove the problem by the highest mathematicians, top minds at that time. And what was now problem given any map with n number of regions or countries, is it possible to color it by four colors? Just four colors so that no two regions get the same color. And this was announced to the London Mathematical Society in 1878. Alfred Kemp found two simpler versions that were published in the next year. That means in 1880. And his proof stood for 10 years. Once he gave two simpler versions that it can be really done, but after 10 years, there was found an error in his proofs. So the problem still remained the problem. So mathematics people at that time used to call it as four color conjecture because we didn't know whether it's possible or not. So unless it's proven. In 1880, Tite, another graph theorist, another mathematical physicist, he offered a solution. And his solution went on up to 1946 when William Tutt found a counterexample to his problem. So during the first half of the 20th century, mathematicians focused on modifying these kinds of techniques to reduce complicated maps to spatial cases, which could be identified and classified to investigate their particular properties and develop the idea of a minimal set of map configurations. So, Mathematicians used to work on the configurations, how they can, because with n number of countries, n number of regions, it gives law, many, many configurations how to deal with. And then the task was set. It was seen that the set was thought to contain nearly 9,000 members, which was really a difficult task. And so the mathematician turned to computer techniques to write algorithms that could do the testing. So this was the first problem in the mathematical history that once the number of configurations was large, so mathematical mind was not able to store this thing. The memory was not that enough. So people shifted to the use of computer techniques and algorithms to devise these configurations. So the algorithms used modified version of camps. Jo Camp was given, had given earlier two possible solutions which were disproved. So original idea was coming from those two solutions, camp solutions. And the original thing was to minimize the number of configurations. And in 1976, Apple and Haken, with the help of Koch, established what's now called as four color theorem. They found a solution with the help of computers and it was really said that this thing is possible given any map, we can color the regions by four colors. So from 9,000, these persons reduced the configurations to 1,936, but it also took a lot of time. So the sophisticated computer available in US at that time took 1,200 hours to compute such things. And since then also many algorithms have been devised. And in 1994, the number of configurations was reduced to 633. But it really took large amount of time, 1000 hours almost to reach the solution. So, but there's a small problem with this, this uh, conclusion of Apple and Haken. The conjecture did transform to the theorem, theorem, which means the law. So it is possible to do it, we can do it. But most of the mathematicians did not accept that proof because they said that it involved the large scale use of computers. We need the proof which uses only analytical way of doing things 
by human brain because mathematics everything has been proved by doing the the analytical way of course the proof is valid but we need the analytical way of proving this thing so a shorter proof of apple and hacken appeared in 1998 which was given by robertson sanders samuel and thomas and in 2004 one tier of microsoft research in cambridge announced that they had verified the robertson proof the proof given by robertson was verified by gone here by formulating the problem in the by formulating the problem in the equational equational logic program and confirming the validity of each of its steps so the proof was valid and j ferro has defined a number of purported short proofs of the four color theorem so many proofs came during those last 20 30 years but all proofs were not found correct and uh, ferro has uh, tested the validity of those proofs which were not correct so i think should i go to the third uh, problem rajesh or only 5 minutes is there sir so you can skip the fourth problem it will okay. take time okay so two problems i think they are in f so both these problems are with us and they gave rise to this great uh, theory in mathematics which is called as graph theory and uh, after my talk uh, one of the greatest graph theorists of india will be talking about uh, more about Uh, application so i don't want to touch any application here he will be giving very uh, nice insight of those applications uh, <clears throat> like you can see uh, <clears throat> a couple of fields medals uh, from the in the recent past uh, had also roots from graph theory doing things in graph theory and uh, you can see graph theory is not only used in 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 other parts of sciences but mathematics itself many pure mathematicians topologists um the people doing analysis and algebra are uh, trying to switch towards graph theory to get help from the techniques from graph theory to solve um the difficult problems which are unsolved or to develop the theory in newer directions so that's uh so i can hear <clears throat> i don't have time for these beautiful pictures to show you and i thank you for your attention thank you sir thank you for such a nice introduction to graph theory <laughs> your lecture with yes sir if there are any questions or comments i will be very happy to respond to that yes sir dr sumit are there any questions on youtube from participants basically sir there are no such questions but there are the whole live chat box of the youtube is filled with that appreciations of the lecture which has been held they are uh, telling that the lecture as well as the speaker had clearly stated the graph theory motivation through the bridge problem color problem and uh, the next which was to be held of regular polyhedra so they are appreciating the lecture and uh, they like the lecture very much thank you very much my pleasure thank you sir thank you sir for such a nice introduction to graph theory and thank you for making the participants <clears throat> they will definitely study graph theory with lot of interest now thank you sir my pleasure so so next next lecture is by professor s arumugam is professor s arumugam here Yes sir. 
professor asarumugam can be rightly said as one of the significant and most versatile graph theorist in india with experience of more than 50 years professor arumugam is currently an adjunct professor department of mathematics amrita vishwavidya peetham tamil nadu he is also an adjunct professor in department of mathematics ramanujan college his research field is very vast which includes network analysis graph theory and its application fuzzy logic and its application to pattern recognition topology geometry and visual cryptography social network analysis and biological networks he has more than 250 publications and more than 20 books to his credit most of these books are prescribed as textbooks by the board of studies for undergraduate courses in various universities and autonomous colleges throughout tamil nadu he has successfully completed six projects from serb dst he has organized more than 25 national and international conferences he has delivered over 350 lectures across the globe he has been conferred lifetime achievement award by gatr malaysia experts from usa south africa and finland are engaged in identifying founders of graph theory country wise in their tentative list they have included professor arumugam as founder of graph theory in india he is an editor in chief of a web of science index journal named akc international journal of graphs and combinatorics and he is in the editorial board of some highly ranked international journals we thank professor arumugam for accepting our invitation to deliver a lecture in this refresher course now i would like to invite professor arumugam to deliver his talk on an applications of graph theory please sir oh, sure. my screen is not coming your screen is visible but sir you have uh, shared your browser so let me see you have not shared your ppt sir you have shared your browser so let me share screen okay yes, now okay we chose on the file okay sir is it okay yes sir now it is fine okay fine yes so i'm very happy to be a part of this FDP organized by Ramanujan College, which is doing very nice work in organizing such events, so as to motivate teachers and scholars to learn new subjects. In the first lecture, we just had a glimpse of what a graph is, but graphs come everywhere. That's what I want to say first. For example, take a set of people around you or in your classroom, and you define a relation among the people by saying V one is related to V two if they are friends. Of course, I assume that if V one and V two are friends, both of them agree that they are friends. Let's say assume that the relation is symmetric. Then I take this set of people as vertices and join two of them by an edge if they are friends. You get a graph, okay? So a graph is nothing but a set of vertices and you're just joining pairs of vertices. Fine. So this is an example of a graph. You have so many graphs around you. Okay, you have so many graphs around you. For example, you have a Facebook network. If two people exchange information through Facebook, you join them by an edge. So it's a the set of all people of the People having Facebook account forms a graph. It's a mil, huge graph, consists of several billions of vertices. Okay. Again, in the same set of people, suppose I define a relation in a different way. V1 is related to V2 if V1 knows the name of V2. What will happen now? V1 is related to V2 if V1 knows the name of V2. 
Just my relation. Now you see that B1 knows the name of B2. Does not imply B2 knows the name of B1. So how will we represent it by a graph? So the relation is not symmetric. So if B1 knows the name of B2, join B1, B2, and put an arrow pointing from B1 to B2. That is, this data can be represented as what we call a directed graph. Okay, it's a directed graph. There's a direction associated to the edge. B1 knows the name of B2 means B1, B2 is an arc with arrow pointing from B1 to B2. If both of them know their name each other, then both arcs will come. B1, B2 will come as arc, B2 even will come as another arc in the reverse direction. So it's a directed graph. Again, take the same set. Now suppose I consider a situation where two people like each other or they do not like each other. Okay. Two people like each other or they do not like each other. How will you represent it as a graph? Again, what does it is? The same set of people. Fine. If B1 and B2 like each other, put an edge V1, V2 and put a plus sign to indicate that they like each other. If V1, V2 hate each other, put an edge but put a minus sign to say that they hate it. They hate each other. If they don't like or hate each other, don't put an edge. They are strangers. Don't put an edge. So again, I get a graph. But set, vertex set is set of people. And edge set is positive and it is positive or negative according as the people joining them like each other or do not like each other. So such an object is a signed graph. Okay, such an object is a signed graph. So we have graph, directed graph and signed graph coming as examples from real life situation. What I have put in real life situation occurs in biology also. In biology, we talk of proteins interacting with each other. So vertices are proteins involved in a, a situation, in a, in a biological process. If the proteins interact with each other, you put an edge connecting the two concerned proteins. If they do not interact, interact in the biological process, don't put an edge. It's a simple undirected graph. Okay? It's an undirected graph. But there are certain biological processes where B1, one protein activates another protein, not interaction, it's activation. B, a protein B1 activates another protein B2. Does not imply B2 will activate V1 or B2 will inhibit V1. So I have two types of biological processes, activation and inhibition. Activation, I will put as plus. Inhibition, I will put as minus. And then the biological network becomes a signed graph. Where the vertices are proteins or genes, whatever it be. And if two of them activate, if one activates the other, you put an edge with a plus sign. If one inhibits the other, you put an edge with a minus sign. And Sometimes you may have to put both sign and plus. V1 activates V2, does not imply V2 activates V1. So we may have to put a, a arrow as well as a sign. So the situation of proteins activating or inhibiting one another is a signed directed graph. It's a very complicated situation. Signed directed graph. So you see that this graph theory comes in biology in a very natural way. The biological process can be described as a graph where the vertices are proteins or metabols or genes and whatever it may be. Okay, so graph comes in biology in a natural way. Good. So graph theory occurs in real life in every situation. The power grid network, communication network, computer network, the web network, www network, web pages are the vertices, 
If there's a link from one web page to another web page, put an edge. Okay, so you have infinitely many situations, so several situations which can be naturally represented as a graph. So let us see how to analyze the graph. Let us say the simplest situation. See, here is a graph. Okay. Now, in a graph, degree of a vertex has just been defined in the previous lecture. Degree of a vertex is number of vertices, number of edges passing through a vertex. Okay, number of edges passing through a vertex. For example, in the friendship graph, it is number of friends of a particular fellow. Degree of a vertex is number of friends that particular fellow is having. I am going to say that in any such graph, at least two fellows will have same number of friends. Do you expect? See, what's such a nice situation. In any graph G, undirected graph, there exist at least two vertices with equal number of degree, with equal degree. Or in the friendship graph, at least two vertices with equal number of friends. Okay. Very simple statement. Nice application. Okay. In any graph on n vertices, at least two vertices have equal number of degree, equal degree. How, what's the proof? First of all, suppose the graph has n vertices. Then the degree can be one of the integers, 0, 1, 2, n minus 1. It can't go beyond n minus 1 because 1% one, 1 can be adjacent to all the remaining, then we get degree n minus 1. So degree can be any integer between 0 and n minus 1. Okay. Degree can be any integer between 0 and n minus 1. Suppose no two vertices have equal degree. Then what does it mean? All the, all the degrees are different. That means the degrees will be nothing but 0, 1, 2, n minus 1 in some order. Especially n vertices, n integers. No alternate to you because repetition is not permitted. Suppose no two vertices have the same degree, then the degrees will be simply 0, 1, 2, n minus 1 in some order. So there will be a vertex with degree 0, and there will be a vertex with degree n minus 1. But a vertex with degree n minus 1 is joined to every other vertex. So no other vertex can have degree 0. So a vertex of degree 0 and degree n minus 1 cannot coexist. So this contradiction shows that at least two vertices must have equal degree. Very simple proof, okay? So at least two vertices in any graph have equal degree. So it's a very simple application of graph theory that in any group of friends, at least two, two members will have equal number of friends, okay? I'll give another simple person, similar to this, similar to this. In any group of six people, there exists a subset of three who know each other or a subset of three who do not know each other. See, in any group of six people in the world, take any group of six people scattered anywhere in the world, I claim that you can find three people in the group who know each other or three people in the people in the group who do not know each other. See, what a sweeping statement it is. In any group of six people, we can get a set of three who know each other or a set of three who do not know each other. What's the graph theoretic formulation? Take the set of six people as vertices. Join two of them by a line if they know each other. That's all. So I get a graph. I get a graph. Okay. Then if three people know each other, they will appear as a triangle in the graph. Because they know each other, all of them will be joined to each other. So if three people know each other, they will appear as a triangle. If three people do not know each other, they will appear as three independent vertices, three vertices with no edges between them. That I call, uh, the first thing is a complete graph, K3. People who know each other is K3. People who do not know each other is the complement, K3 bar, three vertices with no edges. So in graph theory language, the problem says that in any graph on six vertices, 
either a K3 or K3 bar is sitting inside as a subgraph. You see, the whole thing has become a theorem. In a graph on six vertices, either K3 or K3 bar will sit inside as a subgraph. That's all. So the bustle is converted to a graph theory language as a, as a statement. So statement is in any graph on six vertices, either G or G or the complement contains a triangle K3. The proof is very, very simple. Take a particular vertex, your five edges coming from that. Okay. Five edges com coming from that maximum. Suppose the fellow knows three people, then three edges will come from that. Among the three, if two of them know each other, you get a triangle. If none of them know each other, you get a K K3 bar. And this can be easily, uh, uh, happen. this will happen for at least one vertex. That's it. Therefore, any graph on six vertices has the property that either G or the complement contains a triangle. So this small vessel gave us a huge research topic in graph theory called Ramsey theory. See, Ramsey proved that given two integers m and n, there exists yes integer k such that any graph on k vertices has the property that either the graph contains a km or the complement contains a km. When m equal to n equal to 3, it is the bustle. So it called the smallest such k as the Ramsey number R m comma n. The bustle simply says R3 comma 3 equal to 6. So the simple bustle gave rise to enormous graph theory and the book research area called Ramsey theory. And there's now a book on Ramsey theory. Even today, only a few Ramsey numbers are known. The value of several Ramsey numbers is unknown. And it's a very active research area in graph theory. Okay. So in the previous lecture, we talked about uh, coloring, planar graph, vertex coloring, and four color theorem. All this we already seen. Now I will give interesting application of this graph coloring. A simple application of graph coloring that comes in, in every day in your college or in your uh, university. See, the college wants to conduct examination for all the subjects that is taught in the classroom. So suppose there are 100 subjects which are taught for various students in the, in the college. At present, 100 subjects are taught. I want to conduct examination for all the 100 subjects. Of course, you need 100 slots. But in the same slot, I can conduct examination for several subjects. So that I want to finish the uh, all the 100 examinations in minimum number of slots. So how many slots are needed to complete the examination schedule for all the 100 subjects? This is the question. Okay, so I have 100 subjects for which examination is to be conducted. I want to conduct the examinations in minimum number of slots. This is the problem. Is there any graph theory sitting here? What is your idea? Is there a graph theory sitting here? Surprisingly, it is a graph theory problem. It's actually a graph coloring problem. How? First, I'll construct a graph. Under what conditions we can conduct the examination for two subjects in the same slot? When can we schedule examination for two subjects in the same slot? Say 10 to... The students do not intersect. Yes. There is no common student for both the... There is no student who takes both the subjects. If one student takes both the subjects, we can't schedule the examination in the same slot. So, I'll take the 100 subjects as the vertices for my graph. If there is a student who takes exam for both the subjects, I put a line. Okay, I put a line. If there is at least one student taking examination for both the subjects, S1 and S2. So I get a graph. So I get a graph. Fine. I color the vertices of the graph with some colors, with a condition that adjacent vertices receive different colors. That is proper coloring. 
I give you a proper vertex coloring of the vertices with minimum number of colors, with k colors. Take all vertices receiving color one. You get V1, a set V1, a set of subjects. No edges there between them because they're receiving the same color. If there's an edge between them, I would not have given the same color. That means all these subjects form an independent set. There is no edge between them. That means for all these subjects, I can conduct the examination in the same slot. That's all. So if the if my coloring uses K colors, all vertices giving color one, you conduct the exam on slot one. All subjects receiving color two, conduct the examination in slot two, and so on. So if K colors are used for coloring the graph, I can schedule the examination in K, K slots. So you see that scheduling of examination in an university or in a college is simply a graph coloring problem. So how is how beautifully applications enter into graph theory, okay? Applications very beautifully enter like this, fine. So map coloring problem is simply a assignment a scheduling problem. Map coloring problem has an application in scheduling, a scheduling problem. Okay, I'll give you another application. So that's what you're done now. Okay, assignment problem. Here, I will take a situation. A company is advertising for some posts, and people are applying for the uh, various vacancies in the company. So I have a set of positions available in the company and set of people who operate for positions in the company. And the company is going to uh, uh, conduct an interview to select suitable candidates for each position in the company. Okay, so this is the problem. I have a set of positions available, a set of individuals available, and I have to assign a position to an individual if he's qualified to occupy that position. That's all. So this is a, a practical problem that comes everywhere. Okay, a practical problem that comes now and then in every, every organization. Any college wants to fill up the lecturer post. Okay, so they have to do this exercise. So now I have a set of jobs and set of individuals. I will construct a graph. An individual is connected to a job if he's qualified for that job. That's all. If an individual VI is qualified for a job WI, he join VI and WI by an edge. So set of jobs on one side, set of individuals on other side, edge goes from individual to the job. So it's what is called bipartite graph in graph theory. Bipartite graph. Because there's no edge between jobs. There's no edge between individuals. Edge goes from an individual to a job. If the individual is qualified for the job, you put an edge. That's all. So I have a bipartite graph where one part consists of set of jobs, other part consists of set of individuals aspiring for the job, and yet just represent the fact that an individual is qualified for the job. Now, what is the problem? Filling up the, all the jobs. Filling up all the jobs. That means for every job, I want to identify a suitable person who can be appointed for that job. That's it. So I want to assign I want to assign, okay, an individual for each job, okay? One, one individual cannot be appointed for two positions, okay? One individual cannot be appointed for two positions. So what I need, I want what is called in graph theory, matching. That's edges which are independent. B1, W1, one edge. B2, W2, another edge. V1, W1 is an edge means individual V1 is assigned the job W1. 
V2 W2 is an edge, means V2 is assigned the job W2, like that. So I want to find a matching, a matching which covers all the jobs. This I want to fill all the jobs. Okay, not all individuals will be appointed, but all the jobs I want to fill. So I want to find a matching which saturates all the jobs vertices. Is it possible? Or under what condition it is possible? See, suppose there are five jobs and only three individuals in your set are qualified for these five jobs together. What will you do? There are five jobs away in the job and in the applicant list, only three people are qualified for all the five jobs together. Then obviously assignment is not possible. So under what conditions the assignment problem has a solution? Okay. That, that gave us a beautiful theorem in graph theory called Hall's theorem. People put it in a very attractive language as Hall's marriage theorem. Why? Instead of jobs and uh, uh, individuals seeking for job, take a set of boys and set of girls in a village. If a boy and a girl know each other, you join them by a line. Okay? No, no line among the boys, no line among the girls. If a boy and a girl know each other, you put a line. I want to arrange, arrange marriage in such a way that each boy will get a girl whom he know already, whom they know each other. So this again an assignment problem, but it's a little more attractive language of marriage. So that is why the problem, the theorem which gives a solution to the problem is called Hall's marriage theorem. So the theorem says that if this is a bipartite graph, because it's a bipartite graph, one part is jobs, other part is uh, individuals, or one part is boys, other part is girls. So it's a bipartite graph with bipartition AB. Then G has a matching that saturates all the vertices of one part. Saturates means you, uh, something is assigned to that. G has a matching that saturates all the vertices of one part if and only if for every subset, the number of neighbors must be more than the number of vertices you choose. If there are three vertices, they should have at least five neighbors. If there are eight vertices, they should have at least 10 neighbors. That is the, that's the theorem. If this condition is satisfied, then the assignment problem has a solution. So it's a very nice theorem, which is taught now as a theorem for a BSc mathematics student in graph theory course or an MSc mathematics student in graph theory course. So a bipartite graph with bipartition AB as a matching that saturates all the vertices of one part, if and only if for every subset of that part, the number of neighbors in the other part must be more than the number of vertices that you have chosen. This is a necessary and sufficient condition for an assignment problem to have a solution. So you see that graph theory gives nice theorems to give solutions of problems occurring in day-to-day -day life. Beautiful. Graphs occur in chemistry in a very nice way. For example, this is the uh, conjugated hydrocarbon, a molecule consisting of two carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. Carbon atom has degree four, hydrogen atom has degree one. This graph is a tree in graph theory language. It's a connected graph having no cycles sitting there. Okay, so this is the uh, graph of the molecule C2H6. Okay, C2H6. Okay, it's a graph of a molecule. So graph, any chemical molecule can be represented as a graph where the vertices are the atoms of the molecule and two vertices are joined if the corresponding molecules are bonded. If the corresponding molecules are bonded, if the corresponding atoms are bonded, you join it by a line. So in this way, a chemical molecule can be represented as a graph. This is C2H6. 
H6. Carbon atom has degree 4, hydrogen atom has degree 1. Okay. We can try uh, uh, drawing C4H10. Okay, C4H10. You will get more than one molecule with that graph structure. The only condition is carbon atom must have degree 4 and hydrogen atom must have degree 1. That's the only condition. Okay. Carbon atom has degree 4 and hydrogen atom has degree 1. So this is the chemical structure of a molecule. Now you see, we can have more deeper uh, mathematics coming into picture. Take the carbon skeleton of the molecule. That is, take the molecule, that, that's a part of the molecule consisting of only the carbon atoms. That's a carbon skeleton of the molecule. So given a graph with n vertices, I can represent the graph by a matrix, an n cross n matrix. How the matrix comes? Here vertices V1, V2, Vn. I am going to put an n cross n matrix. What's ij entry aij? I say aij equal to 1 if vi and vj are adjacent. That's all. So I get a binary matrix where the entries are 0 or 1. Entry is 1 if the corresponding vertices are adjacent and 0 otherwise. So this gives a n cross n matrix associated with a graph. It's a symmetric matrix because aij equal to aji. If vi and vj are adjacent, vj and vi are adjacent. It's an undirected graph. Okay. So it's a symmetric n cross n matrix. The graph gives a matrix. Conversely, given the matrix, I can get back the graph. Put the n vertices. If the entry is 1, put a edge. If the entry is 0, don't put an edge. That's all. So the graph represents a matrix, and the matrix gives back the graph. So for studying graph, it is enough to study the matrix. OK. So you get the adjacency matrix of a graph. It's an n cross n symmetric matrix. So given a matrix, a square matrix, we have eigenvalues of the matrix, which you study in your BSc class. You take determinant of A minus lambda i equal to 0, where i is the identity matrix of the same order. So it's a characteristic polynomial. It's a polynomial of degree n. It has n roots, which you call lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. The n roots are called the eigenvalues of the graph. So you see, I have combined three different areas, graph theory, chemistry, and algebra. Graph theory comes to get the graph of the molecule. So graph comes from chemistry. If the graph comes from chemistry, the, from the graph, matrix comes, so go to algebra, and that algebra gives you eigenvalues. Okay, what to do with eigenvalues? And chemists found that these eigenvalues of the graph represent the energy levels of the molecule. So you see how beautifully things are coming together. The eigenvalues give energy levels of the molecule. So this is how different subjects come together and get interacted in a beautiful way. Okay. So very nice application of graph theory and algebra in chemistry. This part of graph theory is called algebraic graph theory. The previous speaker is an expert in this topic. Prisala is an expert in algebraic graph theory and Dyson values. Okay. So given a chemical molecule, I get a graph from the molecule and from the graph go to the adjacency matrix and from the adjacency matrix get the eigenvalues of the graph 
and use the eigenvalues of the graph to get the energy levels of the molecule. This is the summary of uh, this application. Very interesting application coming from chemistry. The final application is take a road network of any big city like Delhi. Okay, take a road network of a big city like Delhi. I want to introduce one-way traffic system. What to do? I want to introduce one-way traffic system in a road network of a city. This is the problem. Okay, this is the problem. I want to introduce a one-way traffic in a road network system of a city. So road network is an undirected graph. So I want to orient the edges. I want to put direction to the edge. If I put a direction from U to V, then you say traffic flow is allowed only from U to V. From V to U, you should not travel. That's one way traffic. So I want to assign direction to the edges of the graph. Or in other words, I want to orient the edges of the graph such that from any vertex, you can travel to any vertex along the directed graph, along the directed path, respecting the direction you must be able to travel. Then one-way traffic system is implemented. So under what conditions one-way traffic system can be implemented in a network? A simple example, suppose you take two triangle with a bridge connecting the two triangles. Then one-way traffic cannot be included. Why? You have two disjoint triangles, just one edge connects them. If that edge is given a direction, from, from one triangle you can travel to another triangle, from the reverse triangle you can travel back. So you see, we can travel between any two edges, respecting the, uh, respecting the direction. So in graph theory, it's proved that the edges of a connected graph can be oriented such that the resulting oriented graph is strongly connected. Strongly connected means we can travel from any vertex to any vertex respecting the direction. Respecting the direction. If and only if every edge of the graph lies on a cycle. So you see, if you put a two, two triangles, just one edge connecting them, the connecting edge does not lie on a uh, cycle. So you see that in a, such a graph, one-way traffic cannot be introduced. You have to put another bridge and allow the direction in uh, both directions. So you see, one-way introducing one-way traffic in a, source, in a road network can be solved using graph theory. You can give efficient way of assigning one-way traffic in a road network using graph theory. So these are all very interesting practical applications of graph theory, where the problem comes from a practical situation. I put it in a graph theory language, then develop a theorem in graph theory, which gives a solution to your problem. So this is how the whole thing has come up. So this is how graph theory gets applied in day-to-day -day life. Okay? Graph theory is applied in day-to-day -day life. So this is the a major idea that I wanted to convey to you. Now we have time for interaction and questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Sumit, is there any question from YouTube? Dr. Sumit, sir, there is one question. Yeah. One participant yeah. has asked that using yeah. graph theory, can we get close to curing genetic disorder by modifying DNA structure or not? See, graph theory has a lot of applications in biology, lot of applications. And a lot of people are studying about uh, gene regulation. Gene regulatory network is a very big topic in biology, very big topic. In fact, we are now in a pandemic situation where we are not able to meet and still interact 
through online mode. See, the spread of such an epidemic can be modeled using graph theory. See, contact tracing, people are talking about contact tracing. From whom a person got in infection? That is contact tracing. Government is doing contact tracing very, very meticulously. So if you give the data of contact tracing, I can get the directed graph. If a person A has received a disease from B, put B A and put an arrow from B to A. So contact tracing can be represented as a directed graph. Then if a fellow has large out degree, then that fellow is a super spreader. He's spreading disease to so many people. If a person has large out degree, what does it mean? From him, so many have contacted the disease. So super spreaders should be identified and that fellow should be put in quarantine. See, since like this, epidemic, spread of epidemic can be studied using graph theory. So a lot of work is going on in biological uh, networks with applications of graph theory. So the problems which the student has mentioned is actually being studied by experts in biology. Okay, sir. So, Mr. is there any other question? There is one more question. So the participant is asking to explain the induced subgraph. Induced subgraph. Okay. You take a graph and take a subset of the vertex set. Any subset, okay? Take any subset of the vertex set. You take that subset as the vertex set. Put all the edges present in your original graph joining the vertices within this subset. Such a graph is the induced subgraph of the graph. You fix a subset of the vertex set, take that subset as the vertex set for your new graph, and put all the edges present in your original graph connecting these vertices, then that subgraph is the induced subgraph of the original graph. Okay? That's a maximal subgraph of the given graph having that vertex set, yes. That's a so a maximal subgraph of the given graph with a prescribed vertex set as the subset. That's all. That's an induced subgraph. So vertex induced subgraph. Similarly, you can talk of edge induced subgraph. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. So there is one more question. Yeah. Uh, the there is a participant named Akhilesh Kumar. He is okay. asking, can the tracing of criminals net network? be worked out through the graph theory. <laughs> yes, there is a, there is an application where a terrorist network is analyzed using graph theory. Okay. A terrorist network can be success, was successfully analyzed using graph theory. See, you know the 9-11 attack in the USA? Yes, it is a big attack in USA where flights were crashed on uh, high-rise buildings. Yes. Killing so many people. That terrorist network was analyzed using graph theory. In fact, I have the PowerPoint where I can show you the terrorist network and how the brain behind the attack was traced after the attack was completed. After the attack was completed, the US intelligence agency constructed the graph of the terrorist network and found the brain of the network who controlled the whole attack. So even a terrorist network can be analyzed using graph theory. So criminal, criminal network of criminals can be analyzed using graph theory. Yeah. So there is one more question by the participant named uh, Vandana Gupta. She is asking how to find the energy of a graph. Okay, the definition is you take a graph G, take the adjacency matrix of the graph. It's a symmetric matrix. Take the Eigen values. You get lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda L. They're real numbers. Complex root will not come because it's a symmetric matrix. So well-known theorem in graph theory that if for a symmetric matrix, the Eigen values are real numbers. So let take the Eigen values, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda N. Take the absolute value, modulus lambda 1, modulus lambda 2, modulus lambda N. Sum it up, that's the energy of the graph. The energy of a graph is the sum of the absolute values of the Eigen values of the adjacency matrix of the graph. That's the answer, okay? Energy of a graph is the sum of the absolute values of the Eigen values of the graph G. 
that is the energy of the graph and so there is one more last question there is one participant who is so much fascinated about your with your lecture that he wants to start the research in the graph theory so he is asking how he should start okay let him contact me through mail <laughs> that's the best way to answer him okay sir and um, so i will give the contact number and the email id to that participant okay that's fine so i would like to tell that the whole youtube chat box is filled with a lot of appreciation for your lecture you. they are really mesmerized by the way that you have explained the applications of graph theory in biology and chemistry and in the real life world thank you very much sir thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you thank you sir thank you for discuss okay. for discussing so many applications of graph theory it is amazing to see how you related graph theory to so many real world problems right this is comes from the deep theorems of graph theory yes solution comes from deep theorem of graph theory carl theorem gives you how to apply to pillars yes. and uh, the one way traffic comes from very deep theorem that there should not be bridge so we are deeply grateful for your informatic lecture sir thank, thank you sir thank you thank you so with this we come to an end of today's session the recording of both the lectures will be available on the portal you all can access the same we are grateful to you all for an encouraging participation in the session i on behalf of all the team members and ramanujan college thank you all once again so thank you everyone so now i am sir let's end the meeting